Hello and welcome to the 20th lecture for AC1002. This lecture is going to look at uh, cladding. So from previous lectures we looked at the building envelope from a technical point of view, from how it handles heat loss or uh, water penetration or the control vapour within the, the, the building and uh, all the various layers that were required to, to do that. Um, the thing that we missed off from those lectures was the thing that gives the building its appearance. So this is the, the outward face of the building we're going to look at today, which uh, for the purposes of this, we'll call it uh, we'll call it cladding because it's a timber frame that's doing all the structural load. Um, the material that we see on the outside is, is really something that, that's added to it that doesn't hold any uh, structural value. Um, so I'm going to call it cladding. You might hear it called a, an outer leaf if it's if it's brickwork, but um, it's all the same kind of stuff. We'll come on to that. So what is cladding? Effectively, it's anything that's placed outside the main structure which doesn't contribute to the load-bearing capacities or capabilities. Um, so if it's brickwork, um, it's carrying its own weight, but not carrying the weight of the roof. If it's timber cladding, then it's fixed back to the, the face, but it's not doing anything structurally. So it could be fixed back to the main structure in timber cladding or metal panels, or it can be freestanding and tied to the main structure, like brickwork and blockwork. Um, and we'll come on to tying later on. Um, it can be solid, so brickwork and blockwork are quite solid, masonry is quite solid. It could be slatted, so timber's usually got little gaps between it for, for ventilation. Um, it can be quite open, so we can use louvers, um, or perforated, or it can be a combination of these things. So what do we what do we have cladding for? Why do we why do we need it? Um, initially, it needs to act as a rain screen, um, so it's the the first layer of protection against the elements. Um, and by rain screen, we we mean something that that, that stops the the snow and the rain hitting the, the construction inside. It's probably not 100% weather tight, but it's enough to be able to, to prevent uh, the, the kind of the driving rain from hitting it. It also needs to protect the breather membrane behind. And, and in the breather membrane lecture, I touched upon the, the fact that if it's left exposed for uh, you know any, any extended period of time, the UV light, the ultraviolet light, within uh, sunlight can degrade it because it's made of plastic and a lot of plastics will degrade in, in UV light. So we need something there that, that provides uh, shade and cover for the breather, breather membrane. The cladding is also important uh, from a, an aesthetic point of view and, and that's probably the primary thing that you'll think about for what your choice of cladding would be. What's it going to look like on the outside of a building? So there's a couple of different types of cladding. Um, and I think you could probably split them into into three different types for the purposes of this module. Um, timber cladding, so we can use, uh, could be placed vertically or horizontally. We can use durable timbers without treating them, or we can use uh, softwood or less durable timbers. We can paint it, we can stain it, so it's, it's quite versatile. Masonry cladding or brick cladding. We can use natural stone, concrete block, we can render things, we can have brick on the outside. So the, again, it's, it, it's very versatile in its appearance. And the last example there is a metal sheet or profile sheeting. So this could be something like um, a, a pre-manufactured panel system uh, with insulation uh, bonded to, to the back of a, an aluminium sheet or it could be uh, aluminium sheets that are formed into um, standing seam, or it could be lead, or it could be uh, metal tiles. So there's a lot of uh, variety in, in, in metal cladding. Now we're not going to go into metal cladding um, because it's quite a complicated subject, um, but it's worth looking at the metal cladding that was used in Grenfell Tower to see how um, something that can be specified for use maybe doesn't hold up um, in, in practice. Um, so there's a lot of questions around metal, metal sheet uh, cladding, so we're not going to cover that um, within this module. So if we look first at timber cladding, there's, there's a few considerations. We need to figure out 
how we're going to put this stuff on the wall. If we have, uh, if we split it between vertical and horizontal cladding, um, vertical cladding needs, or all cladding will need some support behind it. And usually we do that by having a series of battens that form a, a void behind the, uh, the cladding. So those battens would be fixed onto the, the sheathing and screwed back into the studs behind and uh, they, would, they would kind of form a space but also a fixing for cladding. So if we have uh, vertical cladding we need battens which support it horizontally so that we can fix each board to it and battens that run vertically to make sure that there's a space. So there's an addi additional cost and thickness of the wall for vertical cladding. We need to think about the choice of timber. Um, it's going to have a big difference on, on a bigger impact on the appearance of the wall. Um, not only the colour of the timber and the grain of the timber, but also how it's fixed. Um, and I'll show you some examples later on, but I've got a note there saying oak requires pre-drilled ho drilled holes and washers, whereas larch does not. And that's to do with the strength of the timber. So uh, there's an image coming up. Um, different timbers have different durabilities. So a durable timber we can put on the wall and it's, uh, it's going to not degrade under sunlight. It's not going to um, be uh, tremendously affected by fungal attacks. It's maybe going to be resistant to, to insects infestation. So it's quite a durable timber and we can put that on the wall without having to paint it or stain it or, or do any other treatment to it. And usually that durable timber will turn grey over time. So as it gets denatured by the sun, um, the colour will bleach out of it and it'll become a, a kind of silvery grey colour. Whereas non-durable timbers usually need um, a paint or a stain or some other coating. Um, and that needs an ongoing maintenance regime. So if you're using a non-durable timber that's got a stain to it, then every five years you're going to have to, to, to redo that. So that's a consideration at the start. So if we look at an example of a, a, a durable timber cladding, this is a horizontal timber cladding. It's a western red cedar, which is a kind of orangey brown colour. You can see there's quite a lot of knots in it. And the way that this timber has been put onto the wall um, is there will be vertical battens behind that because you've got to fix every board in the same place. Um, and the profile of the timber cladding is quite important. The overwhelming effect of this timber cladding is to give you straight horizontal lines. And these are produced by having a profile which gives a slight shadow from one board to the next. So as uh, architects and designers, you can make choices about the, the shape of the timber boards as well as the materials to give your designs a particular effect. So if we look at that horizontal cladding, here's a, here's a detail here, and uh, I'll get my mouse pencil-y thing out again, see if I can figure out how to draw on top of this. We've got our, uh, our boards and they kind of overlap each other and make a little space for the next board to come in and that forms a, a shadow line between them. So this is generally called shiplap boards. And each of these boards would be fitted back to a, a, a batten that runs behind. So a batten is just a smaller version of a timber stud. It's a, um, a small piece of timber, usually treated um, to stop it being uh, eaten by insects or attacked by fungus. And uh, these things would be nailed on Usually with shiplap you can do one nail and then allow the, the fixing to cover over it so we don't see anything on the face. And the battens would then be fixed back into the, the studs behind there so they'd be nice and secure. And this gap that comes up the side allows for, um, for any moisture that, that's within that space to, to run down the gap behind it. And because we've got vertical battens there's nothing to stop it going up. But also we get some air movement coming up the back of it to help dry out the board. So ventilation behind timber cladding is very important. And with horizontal timber cladding, there's a number of different profiles we can, we can use and each will give you a different uh, kind of architectural effect. Um, the one in the photograph that we saw was uh, this 
the sawn element here. So one board is sawn over the other, and we get a, a sharp shadow underneath um, underneath each board. So at the bottom of the board, you would see a shadow onto the board below. Um, you, but you can use square boards. You can overlap square boards down at the bottom here, or you can get uh, highly profiled boards, which fit into each other in, in quite a distinct way. And, um, like that one there. And usually with this one here, you might look to, to put the nail through that point there. So the next board coming down would step over it and hide that nail. So you get a secret fixing if you use a, a, a more um, extensively profiled board. Earlier on when I mentioned that oak needs uh, washers and pre-drilled holes, this is an example of a, a, an oak um, an oak wall and we can see all these fixings here now the reason that oak needs that is because the board is so strong that if we were just to to nail through it as it expands and contracts so it's going to move move in and out along its length and along its its width um, and across its depth that there's a possibility that these nails would actually start to pop to pop out so what we tend to do is um, and I'll Draw up at the top up here is you would have your board. Wow, that's an awful drawing. Right, we'd have our board like that. It's truly awful. And the screw would come through the, the board like this into the backing, and we would put a washer there and then the dome head of the screw. So the board could move about a little bit, and this little gap here would be enough to be able to to take up that slack. But making the choice about this material means that you have to choose to have the, the fixings on display. And if that's an aesthetic choice you can you can live with and you can design it in, then, then great. The other thing about this image, which is quite interesting, is the, um, the, the, the windows here. So the size of the windows have been sized to work in with the cladding. So we can see that there are four boards for the height and there's a vertical gap that lines through here. So the windows have been thought about at the same time as the cladding. So it's not a, it's not a mistake. It's not a, just a CAD drawing that's been put together. So you need to consider what the outside appearance is and how the cladding is going to fit in to make sure that you can design your windows to be um, in keeping with the rest of the facade. Vertical cladding is a little bit different. And usually in, in Scotland, we're talking about uh, a variation of board on board cladding. Um, so it's front boards and back boards. So we, we find that we've got uh, a board here that we can see going upwards and then behind that there'll be another board and the same to the other side. And these boards will be nailed through. Don't think we can quite, yeah, there's a nail there and there's another one there. And because it's probably large, this timber here, so it's got a quite a rough surface, we don't see the fixings. The board isn't as strong as, as an oak board, so it's not going to pull those, those screws out. It's not going to move about as much, or if, it's, if it is, it's going to be held by the, the, the screws. Um, so the board-on-board -board cladding is, is quite a common way to do timber cladding, uh, vertical timber cladding. And we can see there that uh, we've, we've got kind of what I described. We've got the, the front board at that point and then we've got a backboard running behind it and there's an overlap there of about uh, 20 20 millimeters something like that um, but we still need to have drainage down the back of the boards and we still need to get uh, air coming up the ventilation void to make sure that we can carry that moisture away but if we only had these um, horizontal battens, then if we were to look down the face of the wall, wow, I'm getting really bad drawn on this mouse. Uh, if we only had battens running horizontally, if we're looking at this in section. I need to learn how to use this properly. And the board's coming down here, then this is blocked. So you would get water sitting on top of these battens. So what we do is we put um, an additional layer of battens at the back here so that there's a clear space behind those front battens to get uh, moisture down. The other thing is that, that we usually um, 
we usually cut the top edge of the batten to make sure that it, it throws water um, away from the, 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 the face of the, the, the wall. So we would take a piece of timber and from the top of it we would cut that bit off so that any moisture coming down there can actually roll away. Right, and we'll see an example of that in a, in a detail. So here's a, a section detail through through a, a window, or, um, or possibly a door actually, um, and we can see we've got our uh, vertical cladding boards there, we've got our horizontal battens at that point, and then we've got our vertical counter battens. So we've got a a nice clear space to be able to get some some ventilation up into that spot there and any moisture that's sitting on top of this button here is actually going to start to to fall down backwards so we need a little space down at the bottom so about uh, 15 millimeters and that's to allow some airflow up into that uh, void behind down at the bottom of the opening we've got some other pieces of timber here which are are forming a step and getting it out and um, making a flashing so there's a, a a piece of metal effectively that sits down here and that means that any water down here is actually going to hit that and drain out and drip clear so if we look in plan um, this element here is our horizontal pattern because we're not seeing it in section so this is this is cutting through in this is a, a section and this is a plan. Got to learn to draw with a mouse. Um, so we see that, and then that's our counter band. So that that this bit here is our our airspace running down. I could have saved myself all the trouble if I'd remembered to put that slide in. And these details have been uh, developed up over over many years. Um, of, of practice, but they all rely on um, air to be able to, to dry out the timber and uh, battens to be able to create spaces in these. So if you look at uh, this detail, which I think is from a book called Timber Cladding in Scotland, um, we've got the same kind of details round about the head. We've got battens that are cut backwards to a fall. So they all do the same sort of thing. There's no set size for doing all this um, all this work to make flashings and realistically if you wanted these elements to poke out a little bit more to give you more emphasis you could do that as long as you could actually get a piece of timber to do it um, it does the it would do the same same thing what we've got here is an elevation view as well so we can see the the um, the element that was the the metal flashing sitting at the top there is now sitting over the top of the window and it's got a little uh, folded end to it so, and, and, and these are the boards that are sitting over the top of it. So if we move on to, to masonry cladding, um, timber frames can, can have many different types of uh, masonry cladding. Um, we can use almost any masonry material um, but most commonly it's it's brick or blockwork or stonework. Um, and in contrast to timber cladding, it's not relying on the frame for support. It's uh, supported off the foundation, it's got its own separate leaf of masonry. Um, if we are using bricks, we have to understand that bricks are a set size. So, um, and there is a slide at the end, so I don't have to use my mouse to draw. Um, they're a set size, so usually we would design our building to suit those set sizes so we don't get any funny cuts. And bricks and other stones are available in lots of different colours and finishes. Um, if we've got uniform bricks, we can see the uh, laying patterns, masonry can discolour, the choice of mortar joint can affect appearance and durability of construction. So there's lots of different characteristics that you can choose at the design stage which will make a difference to how your building appears. For most masonry cladding because we're building a separate leaf outside we need to have um, some sort of ventilation within the, the construction 
and usually those are things that, that poke through from one layer to the next and they're, they're going to be visible on the face. We're going to be able to see them. So here's a, a kind of typical example. Um, I think I stole it from the Kingspan website, so I should probably have a reference on that. Um, so we've got our, our, our timber studs sitting here and we have our uh, sheathing board there and this stuff here is our breather membrane. We've got insulation sitting between and uh, I kind of just about see the shiny face of a, of a vapor barrier and then we've got plasterboard inside. And there is a, there is a gap down the back of this, there's a cavity or a void um, before the, the, the brick leaf gets put in. There's a couple of things to, to note on this. I mean, the bricks are quite regular sized. You'd be looking for a, a, a cavity of about uh, minimum 50 millimeters at this point. And, uh, but we need to tie the, the, the wall, the, the outside leaf of the wall, the cladding back into the, the timber frame so that they don't um, fall away from each other. Um, the brick wall is actually quite slender. It's only about 100, 100 millimeters wide. So it actually needs to be supported back off the timber frame. And this element down here is a, a wall tie. And usually what wall ties are, they are um, either a helical um, screw that's fixed back into the, the sheathing and the stud behind. So that will actually go right the way back into here and probably fixed into the structure behind. That's the stud away up here. And uh, in this case, it's got insulation in the cavity and this is a, this round thing is a retaining clip. And what would happen is this, this helical element here would then be bedded into a, a mortar joint and there would be another brick then laid over the top of that. And as those things are uh, put in place and we raise the brickwork up by different different levels, we get more and more of these wall ties in there and it, and it allows your your uh, your two walls, your timber frame wall and your, your, your brick wall or your brick cladding to, to work together as a system. And the number of these wall ties and their frequency relies or, or is dependent on how exposed the building is. So if it's a building in a very exposed location, we'd have more wall ties. If it's not so exposed, we would have less. And that's to do with wind hitting the, the face of the building. So if we're looking at the brick, um, we're going to cover uh, coordinating sizes for brickwork in future modules. So we don't need to know too much about it just now, but it's worth having a, have a think that the size of bricks is related to um, the length of them. So, so we can say that the, uh, the width of two bricks plus a standard 10 millimeter mortar joint equals the length of a brick on its side. Um, and this is called coordinating sizes. So you can lay out a whole building based on, on, on that fact. Um, mortar joints are usually 10 millimeters wide and that's a kind of standard size and a brick is a, a set size so we get two uh, 102.5 across the width and the length is 215 so 102.5 plus 102.5 plus 10 equals 215 so we mentioned that we've got a ventilation gap at the at the back of timber cladding and we need that for a uh, to, to stop moisture getting into the construction, but we need it to um, ventilate the, the construction. So in timber cladding, we need to avoid uh, rot or uh, insect attack or fungal attack. Um, so if we have ventilation within there, the, the, the timber is allowed to dry out, the air is gonna be carrying away moisture. So it's never gonna get wet enough for uh, mold or fungus to grow. So we need a free draining cavity at the back of. Uh, back of timber cladding. The same for brick cladding, but it's not really to do with fungal attack. It's to make sure that the moisture can't get into the timber kit behind it. So we'd normally have a 50 millimeter cavity, but it can can be much wider. Um, and the cavity should be ventilated top and bottom of the wall. 
So you would install small weep vents um, at the bottom and uh, at the top and that would allow a certain amount of air as the wind blows against the building to be able to push its way into that cavity. But because we've got a cavity, there are some issues with um, fire within a cavity. And if you imagine a situation where you have a house that uh, has a number of different rooms at uh, ground floor level and they're clad with brickwork, if there's a fire in one of the downstairs rooms, it's possible for that fire to then um, break the, the, the kind of bond around the window and if there was nothing to stop it, it would get into that cavity. The cavity, because it's a vertical space, would act like a chimney and would carry fire and smoke upwards to another room, but it would be unseen, so there's no fire uh, alarms or smoke detectors within that space. And so we've got to divide up cavities to make sure that they, they, they don't um, act as passages for, for fire to, to move from one space to the next. So what we'd normally do is install a cavity fire barrier and we put them around windows, doors and um, it's a proprietary uh, closer so it's a, it's a bought product and uh, sometimes that can be a fire barrier and a DPC so if it's, if it's waterproof as well. We'd need to divide walls up so we'd want to, to divide them up along their length so we'd have vertical fire barriers at uh, corners, party walls so that's where two houses share the same um, outside cladding and uh, in some other locations depending on the use of the building. If we've got a building that's more than one story high then we would have uh, horizontal barriers so that we could divide up the cavity um, by its height um, and we'd probably have them at intermediate floors and at the, the, the wall head. And what a cavity barrier is, is um, it's usually a solid bar or a flexible bar of non-combustible material. So for a timber frame, uh, timber cladding, sorry, it would be the, these products in, in, in bags. Um, for brickwork, it would be these uh, rigid mineral wool, um, sort of battens, mineral wool doesn't, doesn't burn because effectively it's stone. Um, the, the, the bags I'll come on to in a second, they, they, they work in, a, in an interesting way. But the, the, the rigid ones, um, effectively what you're doing is you're, you're sticking them back onto the, the, the timber frame and they would seal hard up against the brickwork. Oh, red's the wrong colour to do that in. They would seal hard up against the brickwork at this point so that if there was any, um, any fire within this side of the cavity, it couldn't pass by that and get to the other side, especially if this was... Uh, you know, house number one, and this was house number two. So we need to divide up at at, uh, at that point. And and this material is usually um, it's usually fireproof. The, the plastic wrap around about it is really just there for for handling. Um, if there was a fire, it would burn away, but the material would still be uh, would still be there. For timber, it's important to be able to keep the the airflow behind the, the timber going all time. So we can't always just block off the, the cavity. So we use uh, an intumescent material um, which expands under fire. So it's something that when it gets hot and it gets charred, it, um, it reacts with the, the heat, expands out, becomes uh, an impenetrable fireproof foam. So we can get um, a, either intumescent materials, which is this, this cavity barrier here, and under fire it's going to expand out, or we can use the, the bags from two slides ago, which um, are compressed mineral wool that uh, when, uh, when, they, when they burn under a fire, they, uh, the bag gets removed and the mineral wool expands out, and there's, there's some intumescent properties in that as well. So in conclusion, just below the 30 minutes here, sorry about this one, it's a long one. Um, the external skin of a building, the cladding, acts as a rain screen to prevent the worst of the weather reaching the construction layers behind. So it's stopping driving rain and, and snow. Um, regardless of whether this is masonry or timber, there needs to be some sort of cavity behind it to provide ventilation and a means of getting any water that, that, that gets into that space out. Timber cladding... Um, 
usually is fixed back to the frame, so it relies on the frame for support, whereas masonry has its own separate leaf for the, the foundation. So there's a few aspects you need to take from this lecture. Um, first is that cladding protects the breather membrane from UV damage. Uh, that masonry is tied to the timber frame, but not supported directly by it. Um, that ventilation and drainage are handled by a cavity behind the cladding. So we have a, we have a space. And that the cavity needs to be divided uh, horizontally and vertically to prevent the spread of fire. Okay, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I think there's one more lecture. So there's 21 in this series. So um, bear with me for one more. Thank you.